It put my heart in my throat then, it puts my heart in my throat now. It hasn't changed. This book, strangely enough, was um, as much as anything, an opportunity for me to, um, I guess, bring my father back to life. Um, we had um, a, uh, I want to say, probably a, a bit of a strained um, relationship. My parents separated when I was young. And my father was still around town, you know, I, I would see him sometimes standing outside the pool hall or in the palace diner or, or wherever. But the first thing he did after walking away from his family was to start building a new family, not one that he would ever have obligations that could be enforced. But he oddly enough, throughout the rest of his life, as I would discover, found people to be responsible for and to help out in his own terms. He lived a full, rich life with something like a family that I only learned about late in life. And I think that this novel, Nobody's Fool, is, is populated with those kinds of peoples because that's what I did when I started inventing characters, was invent people that my character, Sully, could then feel responsible for he didn't have a son anymore, but he had rub, right? <laughs> right? And he had, uh, and he had um, a character that he could have a crush on, Melanie Griffith's character. He says that he's a changed man. No kidding. Who's this? Hmm? That's Will. He's, um... Hmm? Well, he's my, um... He's just kind of shy, you know, so I don't... So this was this was an exercise, really, in just in just um, continuing a relationship that I just missed so much. And and I, I know this this is not about this particular book, but then I you know I wrote um, years years and years later I wrote the sequel um, to this novel called Everybody's Fool, and I got to do the same thing all over again. I got to I got to revisit our relationship. Um, which I discovered had grown despite the fact that he had died. Uh, our relationship was on grow ongoing. And one of the ways that it, that book was an interesting book to write was that I discovered that Sully, who was based on my father, um, I no longer had sole proprietorship of that character anymore because Paul Newman had embodied him so completely in Robert Benton's movie that I discovered that when I, you know, when I when I went back to resuscitate him again, to bring him back to life, so that we could continue our adventure, um, I was I was I was kind of conflating both the man that I remembered when I was writing the earlier book, and yet some incredibly vivid new memories of him as Paul Newman. Sully. Is that you? Kate, no. What a surprise. Vera will be tickled paint to see you. Your mother doesn't know I'm coming? I didn't think you'd really show up. Nobody's yeah. Fool got up in a heartbeat, and, and probably that was due to the fact that it was being done by one of the most powerful producers uh, in, in Hollywood at the time, Scott Rudin. That rare thing in Hollywood, a producer who, who, who can really produce on, on so many levels, he just, um, he got everything up uh, and running in just an astonishing amount of time. I, you know, we heard that, that he was going to, he was going to produce the movie and it just seemed like almost immediately, suddenly there was an Academy Award winning director, Robert Benton, who had, who had, had signed on. And shortly after that, it, it was no sooner than that that was announced than suddenly Paul Newman was 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 going to going to play Sully, and then Bruce Willis and Melanie Griffith, who was a major major uh, Hollywood draw and, and actress at the time. I mean, it happened with just lightning speed. That movie just could not be made anymore in these times. Not with not with that cast commanding the kinds of salaries, although they all, I think they all took pay cuts in order to do this. Paramount was on board. Um, 
And um, the script got the script got written um, very quickly. Robert Benton wrote that wonderful um, screenplay. And you're right; it was it was off to the races in a way that I've never heard of before, and have certainly have never witnessed since. I ended up doing a lot of work on the screenplay um, because of of all things, the weather. <laughs> um, they started shooting, I think, in November, and they put fake snow down all over the various shooting um, sites. Miss Burl's house, as I recall, was in Poughkeepsie, and the horse, the bar that, that features so heavily in the movie, I think, was maybe in Beacon. There were other scenes shot in Fishkill, so they were all over the place. Um, and they were shooting out of sequence because they only had certain actors like Jessica Tandy, who, who was ill, and, and they only had Bruce Willis for a very short period of time, so they were shooting out of sequence. Um, so at the beginning, in order to make this work, they had to put fake snow down. But after they'd been shooting for just a couple of weeks, it started to snow, and boy, did it snow, and it continued to snow, and it continued to snow. And they started... And they started um, uh, falling behind. Um, and Benton, who his normal modus operandi would have been to uh, to revise uh, on the basis of the, day, the previous day's um, um, rehearsals, but they got so far behind that wasn't possible. Um, and so I got, I started getting, uh, I got a call from Scott Rudin saying, would you be willing to um, to do some revisions on the fly? Uh, and Benton asked me too if I would be willing to do that. And I just had no clue how to write a screenplay. I didn't even have a program. But Benton just said, uh, he just told me what he needed. Here's what we're going to need. Here's what we're going to need for shooting tomorrow or Wednesday or whatever. He would tell me that, that, that the scene was running long. We needed to make some cuts here, here, and here. Or the scene needed extra beats. And could I fill in some dialogue or you know whatever whatever I whatever I could do, and his only instruction to me was to write long, and I will I will use what I can, cut what I can't, um, and um, we'll we'll just see how this works. Um, so that's how I started working on the script. Just a few weeks just a few weeks into it, typing typing away without a word processing program, kind of indenting madly across the page for dialogue. I would send it off to him and then he would show me he would show me what he used out of what I had written which was really just this fascinating crash course in screenwriting because once you see what's of use and what isn't of use um, you learn what makes it tick I continued to work after they uh, after they wrapped the movie I was I was still continuing um, to write because they already knew when they wrapped that there were certain things that were going to have to be refilmed, uh, reshot on a, on a soundstage in, in LA. And so I continued, I, I, you know, they went, everybody went home and I rewrote like two or three scenes uh, in the weeks that followed, um, in the weeks that followed the, the wrapping of the movie. And then they shot those, you know, um, Months later, one of the child actors had grown like about a foot <laughs> since from the from the time they started uh, filming to when they when they reshot some of his pivotal scenes at the end, where that boy has to walk with with Worf's prosthetic leg the length of the the length of the bar at the end of the movie. One of the best scenes in the movie. Nobody seemed to have noticed all that much that how much that kid had grown from from when the movie started shooting. You know, eight months ago. He called in sick. He's on the phone. He's in the Bahamas. Take your pick. He doesn't want to see you. The Bahamas sound swell. Ruby, grab his checkbook. We'll take off. The guy that I described in the novel probably looked at, probably was kind of a scrap iron sort of guy who'd done hard physical labor all of his, all of his life. And he probably looked an awful lot more like Roy Scheider than he did like Paul Newman. But... That was my first lesson, of course, in acting, which means that you always think, I mean, you always think that, that the way your character looks on the page, the way you've described him is the important thing. And of course it isn't. Um, Newman 
Um, there were things that he did in that script. Let me tell you a story about my, my, one of my favorite scenes um, in the movie. This is, a, this is a scene that takes place in a car. It's, it's Sully and his son, Peter. And Sully is trying to explain to Peter why he was such a crappy father, why he, why he bailed out on, on his son for all those years, why he remained so distant. It was my father's house. As far as I'm concerned, it can run. It was some piece of work your grandfather. That good, huh? Yeah, he was, he was good when he was sober, but then I don't think anybody ever saw him sober. In the script, Benton had taken a lot of that, um, that a lot of that dialogue um, in the script. Explanation, basically, was what it was of why, of why Sully feared himself. I mean, he, this is the father. What if he was that kind of father? And he, and, and he was thinking, maybe my son would be, really be better off with his stepfather than he would be with me. But the, but the passage was, even in the script, was very long. And Paul kept saying, we don't need all this. Um, and Benton said, and I said probably even more loudly, well, if we don't have this explanation, how are we going to know? Paul said, don't worry about it. Leave it to me. And so we cut and we cut. And every time we cut, Paul came back and said, no, still, still too much, still too much dialogue, still too much dialogue, still too much explanation. Just put the camera on me. Let, let me worry about it. And, and, and Paul had gotten rid of like 99% of the dialogue. And basically all he said, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but basically all he, all he said was, your grandfather, and he just shook his head and the wipers are going. And the camera gets in close on Paul's face. And he said, your grandmother he could make her fly. Your grandmother took the worst of it. She was just a tiny little woman. My God, he could make her fly. And Newman's face was the face of a man who was still haunted by what he could not speak all those years later. And it gave a dimension to Sully just how profoundly wounded he was after all those years. He cannot get the explanation out, which is, of course, the explanation and is also, of course, a great, great, great actor at work. And um, that's, why the, so that's why the character doesn't completely belong to me anymore. I'm putting the finishing touches now on a third Fool novel. And Sully this time, like Miss Burl in the last novel, Sully now is no longer living, but he's still there. He's his ghostly presence. And more importantly, or as importantly, Paul Newman's presence is still there uh, in the third novel, still informing things about this character that I didn't know until Paul showed them to me. You know, I think I'm getting too old for this job. How come? You're starting to look good to me. I do that. I grow on people. I've had people come up to me, still come up to me over the, over the years and say what they love most about the novel was how faithful Robert Benton's script was to that book which always makes me smile because of course, you know, he cut about 500 pages out of it, <laughs> you know, but he was faithful to the spirit of the thing. He was faithful to um, the spirit of the author's tone, which I think he captured the, 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 the kind of book it was, my attitude towards, um, these characters in this book and what happens to them became Benton's attitude. And um, he was what a great screenwriter has to be, I think. He was faithful, even as he was being absolutely ruthless 
because it couldn't be a three hour movie. It just couldn't. The experience of that and the experience of, of Robert Benton's friendship has meant the world to me because it came at exactly the right time in my career. I was, I was then a novelist. I knew how to do that. And just the heady, the heady um, idea of trying to learn something so difficult among people who really wanted who really wanted to do the same thing. Well, I got to do that all over again in mid-career, thanks to Robert Benton, who gave me that tutorial in screenwriting, taught me a skill that I didn't know I wanted to learn how to do, and uh, has and has changed has changed my life just dramatically because I don't work in in film as much anymore because there aren't any many as many character driven movies anymore. Most of that, most of the character driven stuff is being done on TV now, but boy, it came along at exactly the right time. And I owe him a great, great debt of gratitude. Thanks for calling. The uh, situation at the house has just gone ballistic. What's with you and Charlotte? Sometimes I think you did the smart thing, just running away. I only got about five blocks. Well, you might as well have gone to the moon. You trying to get me to say I'm sorry? No, I know better than that. It's interesting that you see well, me as Peter because um, Peter, I, I have become more like Peter in the second and the third novel. Peter always struck me in the first in the first novel as um, I, I didn't really I didn't really like him that much. He's a he's a bit of a whiner. And um, um, of all the characters, I've made great movies, and we'd watch them in both the novel and uh, and in the screenplay. Um, that I that I feel the least affection for Peter is Peter is maybe that character, which which doesn't mean that he wasn't based on me. I mean, it could be an exercise in self loathing for all I know. In that case, could I borrow ten dollars, Rob? There are women in this town that I could hang out with who would be cheaper than you. Yeah, but they wouldn't be your friend. The character that broke my heart, of course, was Rub, and that was because Pruitt Taylor, Pruitt Taylor Vince, did really embody uh, Rub. It's not even love; it's adoration. He cannot get close enough to that man. He is. You know, it's not a homosexual relationship, um, but it has the intensity of 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 a marriage almost. He he just cannot get enough of Sully. He wants he, if there's any way he could live in Sully's house, he would. Um, and and when Sully when Sully drops him off at night at the end of another horrible day's labor, he just cannot wait to get back to him the next day to tell him about all the things he wishes for in life and that he's never going to have. And Pruitt Taylor Vince understood that. He made my bones ache watch, watching him, physically watching him um, uh, embody, embody that character. You get it figured out and get back to me, all right? Hey, Don Sullivan, thief of snowblowers, poisoner of dogs, secret father and grandfather. How are they hanging? Well, I, I, I really loved Bruce Willis's um, performance um, as Carl Roebuck because he was he was at the height of his popularity that time he was doing diehard kinds of kinds of movies and he was wonderful in those but um, but they didn't demand the kind of deep dive into character that Carl Roebuck did and I thought he was just masterful don't say a word excuse me Paul loved writers, not just me. I mean, he loved working. He loved working with with writers. Uh, he had great working relationships with many other writers during his career. Every now and then, I just get a call. I get a call from him. And this voice, never, never hello from Paul. His voice got gravelly or more gravelly as he got older. Their phone would ring. I pick it up, and this voice would say, "Hot shot." That was Paul. He liked to. He liked to call men who were young, younger than he was, <laughs> he'd, he'd, he'd call us all hotshot. And I re, like the third call I got when I, when I won the, when I won the Pulitzer back in 
God, whenever that was, 2002, um, the, the, like the third or fourth phone call I got. And God, the, of course, nobody knew who was going to win that year. Some, some years it leaks, but that year it didn't. And, it, and until it was announced, I don't think anybody, anybody knew. But like the third call I got was from Paul saying, hot shot. Come on, hot shot. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank heavens you're still here. Had it escaped again. <sighs> Stay put, I'll get her. Hurry, she's in the middle of the street. Hurrying is not what I do best. I'm looking for my muffler. Is that the bank? Tell him he's in trouble. Hurry. I am hurrying, it just looks like slow motion. Suddenly here he was again and he got that Academy Award nomination and, and, and I think he deserved every accolade he got for that movie. And suddenly the, of course the books, the, the book completely took off, as did my next novel after that. Um, uh, so it's been, it's been a, quite a ride in that respect, um, because I, I, don't, I don't anymore have sole ownership over the character. I, I, I share him now with a beloved actor with whom I worked on uh, two or three other projects and, and with whom I had, um, I'd like to think, a lasting, a lasting friendship. And it changed my life. Um, uh, it, I began to write novels a bit more quickly. And as I said, I got to learn this brand new skill, introduced me into a whole new world. As a result of that, all these new relationships with, with directors and, 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 uh, I mean, I, I, after that, I worked with Harold Ramis on a movie. I've worked with, uh, other great producers, um, Mark Johnson is going to be doing my TV show of straight man, Mark Johnson, who did, Better Call Saul and, uh, and Breaking Bad. So many of, of what have turned out to be lifelong friendships um, uh, are, all, are all traceable back to this movie.